Okay, good. <laughs> okay, everybody. Happy greetings from New York City. 9 p.m. here. A chilly evening, but I'm in my little cozy house, so I'm okay. Um, What should we talk about then? What should we talk about then? That's a good point. What should we talk about? Maybe someone's got a question. You can start me on ball, start the ball rolling. Are there any burning questions? That's a good start. Anything at all, even just start with something. I'm very happy to talk, I promise. But just something. Something's on your mind. Something's on your mind. No? Nobody? Yes. Come on, Roxy, what's on your mind? Okay, got it. Hi. Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking about fear in relation to finances, how to uh how to hold that. Some of it feels wise, but some of it just feels like attachment or something. How to cope with fear about finances. Oh, it's, it's a very big one, isn't it? Lots of people have masses of fear about money. So you mean fear about not having enough, fear of losing it? I mean, what? Fear of spending it? Fear of not, like, I thought I was going to be able to make a certain amount and I had, like, a, it seems like things are shifting. So fear about not having enough in the future. For the future. I, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, because, I mean, Life is, I mean, it's, things are incredibly expensive, isn't it? It's really true. And I'm just astonished. I mean, I'm an American now, but I'm astonished at the low, at the low basic wage in this country. I mean, it's very, very shocking, you know. I mean, not everybody gets the basic wage. But I mean, in some countries, I know, for example, Australia is not that a fancy country, nothing special. But I think the basic wage is something like $25, $23 an hour or something. But here, you've got to fight for, I mean, even... I mean, just even people who go and work at Walmart or work in those places, you you can you just literally can't survive. So I'm not surprised people are worried about money. It's incredible, because I mean you've got to pay medical in this country. It's really quite shocking, you know. I say to people because I've got no medical. I say to people when I get if I really get bad, just ship me back to Australia where I get free medical, right? At least there you can be taken care of. You know, it's unbelievable. Anyway, it's a difficult one. Um. So I suppose for you, you have to work to more earn money, right? You need a job to earn money. That's the plan, isn't it? Yeah. And is, is it a struggle to get the work you, you wanted or is it is it to do with your career or is it to do with literally not having enough money or worried about it? I have the job right now, but due to a health problem, I have not been able to work. So mm. my pay has already decreased a lot because of missing work. Of course. And I mean... I, ho I hope to be able to get back. Like I do have a great job that I love. Yeah. It's just, I'm making less than I predicted I would this year already because of my health issue. So there's some fear, like, is it going to be okay? Am I, uh, the security feels shaky now. Well, I mean, it's reason. I mean, it's a very straightforward point. If you're not earning enough money because you've been sick and you can't earn it. I mean, it's a very straightforward point. I mean, it's, it's, it's but are you, so I think part of it, I mean, sure, it's a problem. It can be a serious problem. But I think part of it, too, is I think people aren't very good at managing money. Are you intelligent about money? You see I, I mean? save a lot, but oh, it's... Uh, okay. That's interesting. Because I, oh, I, I do is, have I, a good I, savings, but I'm scared of losing it. Yeah, that's I know, it. I, well, yeah, okay. Well, that's, see, that's where you've got to be sensible. I mean, why would you be losing it? What's going to happen? Somebody's going to steal it or the country will collapse. <laughs> so what do you mean by lose it? That's uh, just, that to be irrational, you know. It's fair enough to be worried, but if you know how to save and you're cautious, then why would you be worried you're going to lose it? You said those words, lose it. What do you mean? Hmm. What do you mean by that? I think just uh, the expenses that I currently have would just kind of tick it down and down. I have a fear, like, what if I won't make more money? There are some that are just not rational fears. But uh, yeah. that's where that's where I think that's where I think we have to be really sensible, right? People, I mean, it mightn't be fear of money. It could be fear of the dark. It could be fear of not having a partner. It could be fear of getting old. We all have our fears, right? So, and mm -hmm. maybe they're relatively reasonable to have, but we've got to really distinguish between reasonable common sense and irrational ones. And it's very hard if they're irrational. It's very hard to get past fears, isn't it? It's really hard, you know. I mean, so so you, so the, you you seem to know well off your mind. I mean, you know yourself. Are you trying to deal with it? You try to be 
intelligent with yourself, sensible, talk yourself through it. But in the end, there's no shortcut. You know, a pill won't help. Earning more money would help, maybe. But on, on the other hand, many people with plenty of money and savings still up from freaked out about money. Very strong, a very strong impulse of being. And you, we just, since we're kids, we just pick it up from our mum and dad and we don't change. So I think one of the things is to be, um, is to really know well how to manage it and not be fit, not to be afraid of it and have not to have this knee jerk reaction. Oh my God, that's too much money. I can't spend that. Oh my God, I won't have enough. You've got to really understand the irrational part for, and, and distinguish it from the sensible part. You know, that's always every, in every case. If, if, you, if you're worried about being raped, if you walk down the street, people can be reasonably intelligent, but if you're really extremely fearful, then you've got to work with it. I mean, it's not, it's not easy, but you've got to distinguish between what's reasonable and what's just irrational. So that's the key point, Roxy. I mean, you know, that's the key point work on our mind this is really the basic job of being a buddhist we learn to use these tools to know that things aren't set in stone and we can learn to conquer things especially when they're irrational because much of our suffering is irrational you understand what i'm trying to say okay. but be sensible be reasonable and then add things up and if there is enough in there and then if you really and then then you have to make some decisions you know then you really have to make choices like live in a cheaper place or move or until you are able to not, not just sort of have fear and cross your fingers you have to be sensible about it isn't it very important yeah thank you that's helpful Good, thank you Good, Roxy. so what shall i talk about i'll talk about i don't know i'm happy to just take i'll just think of a topic then it's always our problem all of us are the same you know we've all got it um all got some kind of problem well one thing i was just talking about i put on the video this morning that there must something to think about videos about helping people and the trouble we get into, especially when it's our beloveds, our friends, our family, we seem to make a complete mess sometimes. So we have to really be able to distinguish what it is that causes us problems when it comes to helping people. So remember the Dalai Lama said, compassion is not enough. You need wisdom. And this is a big problem. So the example I use, you know, let's say you've got an alcoholic brother. And you love him. You really do want and love. So this is the thing about in the Buddhist view of the mind, it's really important to get this clear distinction, which we, we sort of hear, but we don't really sort of really go delve deeply into it, but it's really quite profound. It's not necessarily how we think in the in our modern psychology. It's, it seems simple in a sense, but it's quite profound. The Buddhist view is we've got really, the, we've got the neurotic, fear-based, eye-based, self-centered, don't, don't, don't think that's criticism, it's just natural, Anger, de jealousy, depression, low self-esteem, you know, all this. We know these so intimately. And they're the ones that aren't rational. They're the ones that are extreme, are kind of like, are distorted in the way we see the world and they make us miserable and they cause us to make a mess of our lives. Then you've got your other ones, your states of mind, which are your saving grace, your love and your compassion, your kindness, your intelligence. And we really, and the Buddhist idea is we've all got both. But the key really point in Buddhist practice why you do a meditation or anything is so you can learn to distinguish between them. Because the first lot are the ones that make us miserable. And the second lot are the ones that make us happy. It's almost too simple for words. So we have to, and we have to learn to know we're not set in stone and we have to learn to distinguish between them. And this example I'm using is a really good one. So here we are, maybe we're, you know, we, we, we really are compassionate. We see suffering. There's our brother. We really do have compassion for him. And compassion, the way they define it in Buddhism is it begins with this thought. You see someone suffering and your heart reaches out. You know, oh my God, look at that suffering. This is awful. And then we think, what can I do to help? Which is incredible to think that. And then you have love, which is may he be happy and you want him to be happy. Then you think, what can I do to help him be happy? Which is fantastic. So where's the problem? Well, the problem is because you're attached to your brother, you mean an attachment is this an uh, neurotic kind of emotional hunger, this neediness that is very hard to distinguish from love and compassion. You know, it's really hard to see the difference. So this 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 attachment is needy, it's not comfortable, it's eye-based, it's kind of it is neurotic. And it's very deep. It goes to incredibly subtle levels. So then you're attached to this person. And you're attached, you, you're attached to also, but the, the crucial one is not just attached to the person, but here in this case, it'll be attached. The deepest attachment we have, 
and this sounds very mean in a way, but it's very fundamental, is to be comfortable. Attachment wants everything to be lovely. We want our life to be lovely. We want things to be nice. We want good things to happen. We don't want bad things. We don't want to have not enough money. It's very primordial, you know, to have everything to be nice. It's an, and it's, it's good to want things to be nice, but the attachment is this neurotic neediness. And as soon as we meet something that isn't nice, that upsets our apple cart, then we have a version. So what's happening here is your love and compassion towards your brother, they're valid, they're wonderful, but it's polluted by your attachment for everything to be lovely in your life. So in, other, in a sense, your your brother's upsetting your apple cart, you know, your damn brother, your attachment, is, the two voices in your head, attachment is, you know, is distressed by your brother being an alcoholic because it's upsetting you. And then you have an attachment also then causes us to stick our nose in where it doesn't belong. That's the worst part of attachment. You know, it's a bit like if you're, you know, we all know with our mums, for example, if your mum's really attached, she's always telling you what to do. She believes she possesses you. And she, she tells you she's kind of sticking her nose in and organizing you, running you, controlling you. That's what attachment does. It wants to control everything to make it like what I want. So in a sense, your attachment's neurotic and it wants to go and fix your brother and stop him being an alcoholic in a sense so you can be happy. I mean, we don't think of it so so clearly like that. We don't think it is so brutally, but that's the way attachment works and it's very subtle. So basically your attachment, your own emotional hunger, your neediness for things, for your life to be nice, wants to make your brother better so you can be happy. Your actual love and compassion, they're good, but the attachment messes up with the attachment, messes up with the compassion. So in the end, what it does, it causes you to jump in. Whether or not your brother wants your help, we don't seem to care. We just think it's our job to help him and we rush in and we try to make him go to AA and we kind of, you know, almost like bully him to go to AA. But And that's compassion, but it's polluted by the attachment. And then what happens? He wasn't ready for it and he falls off the wagon and you get upset and you criticize him and you chuck him out, you know. So attachment makes a mess of things. Because it's coming from a, it's this unhappy neediness, you know, and it's very hard to distinguish. That's why in relationships, they can be a nightmare sometimes, whether it's your mother and child, whether it's your your, your beloved, your, your you know, your partner, your sister, anything, any relationship. Attachment's inevitably there. So you want to be close to the person, you want to be near them, but it messes up the the good parts of you. It messes up you know, the love and the compassion. And that's why we have fights in an hour, in a relationship because attachment, when it doesn't get what it wants, you get angry. So with your, you know, your alcoholic brother, you know, you all talk about him behind his back and then he comes home and he vomits in the soup and he upsets mum and dad. So you blame him for upsetting mum and dad and you talk about him. That's because of attachment. And that makes a complete mess. And then you can't see your brother properly. You know, you can't even see him properly and you define him in terms of being an alcoholic. So the thing is, to have wisdom, as His Holiness says, compassion is not enough. You've got to have wisdom. And what that means is just the common sense to know what's the best thing. And so that means to have confidence that what you do do to help your brother is what he wants for a start, unless you want to lock him up and force him to give up alcohol, but it, that he's ready to hear it, that he's ready for the advice. And that's what we never notice. We butt out, we barge in, don't mind our own business and think it's our business and run around and change everybody. That's attachment. And that's what makes such a mess. And it makes us anxious if we don't do it because anxiety is a function of attachment. We panic, you know, but that's why we've got to have some wisdom, which means is your brother ready for your advice? You can see he's not. So you love him for who he is. Maybe you don't invite him to dinner because he vomits in the soup and he's got, you've got to be tough, but you have to love him for who he is. And if maybe one day he asks you about it or you think there's an opportunity, then you can help him. Otherwise, you love him for who it is, for who he is. We want to change everybody. That's attachment. It wants to make everything what we think it should be. We want to make the world the way we think it should be, but in an erotic sense. And it usually means other people, you know. And that's what makes us upset because anger is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. So we're running between these two all the time. And they're the ones that are, cause us to be so stressed and neurotic and worried, you know. So it's really hard to see the difference between attachment and love, for example. It's almost impossibly difficult unless you know your mind well. And that's why, you know, in the Buddhist approach to life, like these basic tools that the Buddhists have, you know, so-called mindfulness meditation, there's a multitude of approaches to it, but a really practical approach to having some simple meditation technique 
you know, of course, it's to help the mind become clear, help your mind be less neurotic. But the real basic advantage of even doing a five minute meditation before you start your day is that what you're doing is you're training your mind to not just follow every thought mindlessly. You're attempting to focus your mind. You mightn't get much focus, don't worry. And what you tend to do is sometimes think you're getting worse because you hear all your crazy thoughts, but you're not getting worse. You're just noticing your thoughts. And we think, oh, I'm, I did a bad meditation. I've got all these thoughts. No, you're mistaken. The thoughts are always there. It's only when you're quite advanced that you can learn to really control the mind. You know, it's quite sophisticated. So the, the, the advantage of seeing your mind more clearly is that when you get off your meditation cushion and you, and you jump into life on the, in the road and the traffic in the kitchen with your friends, with your family, you not only now, whereas once before we didn't notice your mind before you start to meditate. Now, when you're driving the car, you don't wait till you just vomit out the anger, but you now notice your mind. And that's the big advantage from having a basic practice every day. Don't just think it's to make all the ugly thoughts go away. That's just fantasy. It's nonsense. We have to learn to know what our mind is thinking, not make the thoughts go away. Because in day-to-day -day life, you've got to learn to listen to them and then learn to navigate your thoughts and learn to know literally distinguish between the neurotic ones and the valid ones you know it's not the way we tend to think of buddhist approach but that really is the point we have to learn to distinguish between the neurotic unhappy eye-based thoughts the attachment the anger the low self-esteem the jealousy the anger the, the depression and the positive ones and it's not an easy job but that's the bottom line and then learning to hear all those thoughts knowing you're not set in stone and you can lessen the neurotic ones and grow the good ones then that's the job you do you know, that's your job you learn to do. It's a very, it's a cognitive thing. You listen to the thoughts and you literally argue with yourself. It's not some mystical thing, you know. It's not at all mystical. We think it is sometimes, but it's really not. And it means you've got to know yourself very well. Be very authentic, very honest with yourself. Own your own rubbish. Own your good qualities and know that you're not set in stone. This is the basic approach to being a Buddhist, actually. The basic approach of Buddhism, actually. And it's not easy because we we can't we, these all these emotions that's like a big soup in our head we can't tell one bit from another and because we have certain very strong tendencies since we're little kids we just assume oh well that's just the way I am I can't change it you know so we get very stuck but we can't, there's no thought we can't change there's nothing in our mind we can't change we have to have that confidence you know and then it's hard work and it doesn't go overnight so isn't it what do you think people ask me a question now. Ask me a question based on that. Come on. Anybody. You, Sasha, you got your thing off. Talk to me, honey. Can't hear you, darling. Put your volume on. Whatever. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. How about now? That's just really right. Okay. Good. Okay, good. Um, so my question here is um I'm noticing sometimes if I I am like so aware of my thoughts and um like I think I'm like just like so much so that when my friends complain to me about something that they're they're encountering in their life that I cannot resonate. Like I almost feel like I want to be like them that can just experience um, anger in their full intensity. And like, I feel like I'm just like detached from, it, it almost felt like I'm detached from humanity in a way. Well, okay. Um, okay. Good. Sasha. So, so you need to go into that a little bit more for me because on the first, keep your, keep your thing open. Keep your thing open. Okay. On the one hand, you began by saying, I'm so aware of my thoughts. And then you're saying you feel detached because you don't seem to experience anger or something. So you have to put all that from, together for me. I don't understand. Yes. Um, Say a bit more. So, 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 okay. So when, so some, so when I think about like anything toxic or like, I hate this person, I hate that person, right? Like I'm always like aware, oh, like I'm feeling um, a kind of like, you know, aversion towards these type of people. Okay. And then and what do you do aware. with it when it arises though? When, how do you just, approach that? What's your approach to it? I, I notice it and that's it. 
But do you want it to be, you want to be that way or you want to grow it more anger or you want to get less angry? See, what, there's what? a part of me that thinks it's kind of, it's kind of like, it's kind of, it, it's, I feel like it's a part of existence. It's like, if I lessen that emotion of like not wanting to be angry with them, okay. yeah. then how am I still alive? Like, isn't it a part okay. of- Okay, so let's stop right there and let's analyze this because I hear what you're saying but the, okay, so put it this way. Keep your, no, just listen, just listen now. And if you want to ask a question. So this is the whole point. This is the entire point in the Buddhist approach. You know, um, the only, the Buddhist approach is the only, the, the only reason to know your mind, the only reason to want to change what is in your mind has to be because you, you don't want to suffer. You want to be more content. You want to be more fulfilled. Forget about compassion to others, okay? Just think of yourself first. There's the two wings of the bird, the wisdom wing and the compassion wing. And the first one is working on yourself. So the only reason to want to work on your mind, the only reason to want to stop certain emotions slowly, slowly work on them is because they, they break your heart. They make you miserable. They cause you suffering. So if you think by giving up anger, you become less human, then it seems to me you're not just giving up anger, you're giving up love and compassion as well. You're chucking the baby out with the bathwater. So that means if you don't think there's anything, so let's analyze what anger is, shall we? Or even let's just analyze what anger is. Anger, the way Buddhism would describe it, or even the, okay, the bare bone state of mind beneath anger, and there's a whole variation of anger according to your personality is basically aversion so these two main states of mind in buddhism that sound kind of cute to us because we don't talk about them in this way in our psychological models they sound rather cute the, the main primordial one which i just talked about before is attachment it's a simple word and it's not the way we tend to use it in our culture we talk about your mother being attached to her child she's close to her children that's wonderful attachment here is a really needy neurotic unpleasant feeling it comes from not being enough it comes from i don't have enough it comes from it's got an energy of low self-esteem so because you feel you don't have enough then you hanker after something so then you look at the you know first of all you you crave for the objects of the senses believing totally when i get that then i'll get happy and when it comes to people of course it's a complete nightmare you put all your you you can fall in love with somebody and you completely dump all your needs onto that person and you have this massive expectation that they're supposed to make you happy and as soon as they look slightly wrong at you then you have a mental breakdown and it turns into aversion so these are the two states of mind and i think we all recognize the unhappy aspect of these states of mind you're either so attachment exaggerates somebody's delicious qualities and then you have aversion to somebody and so what aversion is doing is now exaggerating their ugly qualities so they are extreme distorted states of mind i mean just look at the world please why do you think people kill rape steal lie i mean is it out of love and compassion i don't think so do you see what I'm saying, Sasha? I mean, would you agree that they don't look, that doesn't look very comfortable, the people don't look very happy, and they make everybody else miserable? Would you agree with that basic idea? That's because of attachment and anger, you know? So maybe you don't have such violent levels of it. So it's more a question of if you look into your own mind, you don't just do it because you think you should, but look into it. If you have aversion for something, aversion for somebody, it might be mild. But then you've got to see if it's disturbing your mind. You need to find that out. And then uh, the only reason to want to not have it or lessen it or argue with it or try to change the story is because that will be more reasonable and make you more content and fulfilled and more courageous in your life. And if you don't think it's any different, well, then it's up to you. So you've got to really look into your mind and see, you know, because you say it's part of life. Well, of course, it's part of life. But it's a question of whether you think it's a good thing to keep in part of life. If you like the idea of people fighting and yelling and having arguments and wars and dramas, I mean, they're extreme examples and they don't come from love and compassion, honey. So smiled anger maybe doesn't look like a problem, but have a look how it manifests in the culture, in people, racially, with every kind of, you know, all the dramas. I mean, do you agree that they come from anger and jealousy and resentment and bitterness? What's your feeling, Sasha? Um, I... I, I do go through life um, and there are certain people, certain types of people that I tend to avoid. Um, and um, and I, I feel like I, in an ideal world, I would like not to 
I live my life around these people of like, oh, like I don't want to talk to them, et cetera. Um, and I also think that that aversion points out to certain aspects of myself. W what that means is that aversion feels like there's a part of me that I'm like, there's a part of me that I dislike. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand your point. So yeah, if you can and, learn from that, that's very good, isn't it? Yeah, but I, but but every time I'm in that position of like talking to them, I just I can be so aware of my uncomfortableness. Mm -hmm. I can be so aware of just like unpleasant. So what should I do in that situation? Do I just like do I just like push through the uncomfortableness? I understand. Do I, do I, I understand. I understand. So in the same way that you can be intelligent, if like if you know there's some crazy person coming at you you know, and going to harm you or a person you, who's asked you to go out, but you know, they're a crazy person. Of course, you don't have to have a, you see, you don't have to have fear. Ideally, we're not, we don't necessarily have to have a fear and aversion of them. We just have to be intelligent and say, no, thank you very much. I don't want to go out. Or you don't go down that street because you know some crazies you're going to meet. You've got to be intelligent. You've got to be sensible, but it doesn't mean it has to be neurotically emotional. That's the thing. So then if you, you, you recognize that certain people upset you, you recognize it and you see it. You learn to know your mind. You just learn to know your mind. You're doing that, Sasha. You're doing that. And you just be intelligent about it. I mean, if it ends up that you get angry with somebody and you fight and yell, clearly it's not going to make you happy. So you, you, if you're in that, if you've got that uncomfortableness, sometimes, yes, don't be afraid of the uncomfortableness. Observe it and then do your best. And the Buddhist approach is as you develop your mind, you get more and more in control in a very good way and things won't distress you, but you'll be in charge of what's going on. You won't be, you won't feel dominated by situations. You'll be more in charge. So, I mean, I think you, you're on the right track, Sasha. You, if you're aware of your thoughts, that's wonderful, darling. Many yeah. And I, I just don't know if it's okay to avoid uh situations like that i just well i just what i said that's a very yeah. sensible okay. thing to do okay but okay. but the, the key point though sasha i think is we tend to think oh, i'm not going to go near that person and then you criticize the person as if it's their fault but as long as you can see maybe they've got some problems but your problem is you have aversion so take responsibility and realize at this moment in time i can't handle that so i'll leave it alone you kind of as long as you take responsibility for what you're thinking and feeling rather than being a victim of it that's a big point do you see my point yeah yeah i i, I think i do i am very, very well aware very of sensible. my problem yeah that's very yeah. sensible sasha that's very good and yes, indeed, as you pointed out, that person might indeed have a problem, but if there's an aversion in you to it, it's triggering something about yourself. So take the opportunity to learn about your own mind and then be grateful that you can see it yourself. That's good. That's great, darling. Very sensible. What else, people? Something? Yeah, go, go for it. I'll try to talk. Oh, yeah, you try to talk. Whispering <laughs> apparently is worse than trying to talk. So apparently whispering is no good for um, the moment. Really? Is that true? It's no, good. That. It's going to go. go. Now. Um, I've been working a lot with a, a tendency. I've discovered to really um, censor myself, squelch myself. And, and it seems to be coming from um, a, a fear of being... Um, rejected by others just to yeah sure 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 paint it broadly absolutely and um, and um i just so that that's the the short version i understand it oh, honey, i'm really this, curious what you have there to you say. Go. this is the this is i would say and this is the way yeah this is the uh the, the most primordial attachment we have this this we call it the fear yeah fear of being rejected basically so what it is if you put it into an overtly what it is is this and since we're kids since we're born we've got it this neediness to be seen and heard by others in a good light we, in other words it's really so simple it's the need to be liked and approved of it's so primordial and throughout our lives until we become conscious of it it almost determines most choices we make especially if it's very strong, we, we, we're afraid to be authentic. We're afraid to say what we even think. We're even afraid to know ourselves, what we want and what we think. Because in our head, we've programmed, since we're born, we program what God says, what mummy says, what daddy says, what the judge says, what the world says, what next door neighbors. And we're trying to cope, you know, we internalize all of those shoulds. And then we figure we've got to do that, then we'll get approved of. And it's really paralyzing and it's the deepest attachment we have 
So it's, it takes a lot of courage to see that. It doesn't mean you just give up not caring what people think. No, that's just being self-centered. But you, we have to learn we have to start, we have to learn to know what do I think? What do I know? Who am I? What do I like? What I don't like? It doesn't mean you rush around doing whatever you like, but you, we've got to know and have the courage to know what we think. Because one of the, the best questions is, well, what do you want? And often we'll go, we don't even know what we want because we're so afraid of, we're so determined to do what we think we're supposed to want. I always remember reading this about this nurse years ago who wrote, Australian nurse who lived in England or something, and she wrote a book. She worked with the dying and she wrote a book called The Five Greatest Regrets of the Dying. And the, mm -hmm. the main regret was that I didn't follow my heart. I did what I thought was expected of me. This is the greatest suffering on the planet, honey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not easy to change, but it's the most powerful one it's sort of a, i love the saying and I'm, I'm, in the we have we say it in in, in, Australia, in english i suppose in american too you know we, we see we need to become our own person we're not our own person we're trying to you know fulfill everybody's needs and that's where we can be a good girl or a good boy and run around being mummy's little helper and then wonder why we get treated treated like a doormat because we're trying to be good. We're trying to be nice. We don't like to say no. That's all a symptom of it as well. It's very primordial. And we've all got it to one degree or another. It's very powerful. Do you understand? Yes, yes. Beautiful. I mean, huge one. It, it, there was an element of it one way that I think of it, that I thought of it since I first had the aspiration to practice is yeah. it's a, a, you're not being honest. There's like a lack of honesty. It's and true. I, try. I, can, I can sort of imagine being on my deathbed and thinking, wow, I really yeah. blew it, you know? I know, so, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So no, so never too late to change. Yeah. There's a nice saying in Tibetan. They say the great, the yogis up in the mountains have given up all the obvious attachments for sex and drugs and rock and roll. And they're up in the mountains, but they're still thinking of what the people down in the village are thinking about them. Yeah. That's, you know, in other words, what are, and that's a voice in our head all the time. We're checking up. What are people thinking of me? Are they liking me? Do they not like me? I mean, we're worrying about it all the time, even on the street, strangers looking at us wrong. Oh, what did I do wrong? You know, because we have this deep neediness to be smiled at by other people because that tells us I must be okay. We've got to discover we're okay on our own. That's the point. It's not worth the price of not being yourself. No, no it's not. <laughs> And, we, and that means it doesn't mean you should care. It doesn't mean not caring if you upset people. That's not the point. It's having the courage to know that you can't make everyone happy. No matter how hard you try, you can't do everything that makes people happy. You've got to have the courage to do what you know is the right thing because it's your responsibility and it's your right, as long as it doesn't hurt other people, as long as you're not overtly hurting other people. But if people don't like what you do, whether it's your mum, your partner, that's their problem, you know, and that's very scary for us. Good on you. Hello. This is the one we're very, it's, you know, we're always adjusting it to what we think the other person, you know, and we're sort of playing games that we're too scared to be clear with ourselves. What do I want? And of course, the major problem here, and I don't know if it's yours, but this one of needing to have feel we can't survive without a partner, you know, this is a huge one. And then look at the nightmare of some relationships. I mean, just, I can't even imagine how people can even live together the way they do with all their unhappy stuff and their the blame and the resentments and the bitterness and sleeping in the same bed of a person like that. I just think it's enough to make you crazy because of the need to think we, we think that we're not a whole person if we don't have a partner, you know, it's so heavy. We've got to really have courage to look at that, you know. Wow. But if we're honest and love a person for who they are, including their alcoholism, including their anger, then fine. You can be in charge of your life, you know. So we've got to know what we want, what's best, and what's best for us as well. Realistic. So you people, it's 10 o'clock. What time do we start? 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. I forget, 9 o'clock I start. It's 10 o'clock. Okay, good. We've got some more time then. Come on, talk to me. All these people are solving our problems here. Come on. <laughs> yes, Roxy. Hi again. Uh, this is an amazing teaching. I'm loving everybody sharing so much. Thank you. Question about um, advice for how to find a good and legitimate Tibetan doctor in 
the U.S. or, you know, well, not there's plenty of Nepal. Tibetan doctors, darling. There are plenty of Tibetan doctors. How to so, find but, a legitimate just, one? Well, they, well, you'll soon find out from their website. whether. They, so why don't you check and research and then send me their names and I'll check for you. Easy. Really? Yeah, of course I will, Mary. Okay, thank you. Good, darling. <laughs> okay. Where do you live? Uh, Los Angeles. Okay, so there's, I know there's plenty of doctors. There are plenty, darling. But send me names that you find and I'll check for you. Okay, okay. darling. Thank you. Pleasure. So, people, what else? I mean, we don't have to hang around for any more if we don't have more to talk about. But, you know, I think this, but everybody, the topic is the same. This is really the one, you know. It's sort of, it all comes to this. And it sounds sort of surprising because it's not, I guess I keep saying, it's not the analysis we use in the psychology. It's just not. I mean, we have various bright terms, you know, like, Joey talked about her partner said it's reactivity, which is, I mean, I call it anger, you know, when your attachment doesn't get what he wants. It's a variation of that. I mean, it's hard to always see it, but in each case, Michael's one, you know, Joey's one. It's very similar, but it's always, and it's, this is what, to, and, and okay, it's Sasha's diff, diff, slightly the same point. It's really the one, you know, and certainly, you know, Noam's point is the same, but this attachment is is multifaceted. It manifests in so many different ways, you know. But the the one that really that we're all linked, the sharing here, the one Michael's one is particular is, is you know, and again, Joey's, is attachment for, for people to be the way we want them to be. There can be compassion there. Michael's really right about his wife and daughters, you know, but when it's mixed with attachment, you're really right about your alcoholic brother. Look what he's doing to himself. But You've got to have the wisdom to know that your intervention is useful. And if it's not, you're not being selfish, but we've got to then learn to live with, and that's Michael's point, living with the discomfort when he, when we see them not doing what he knows they could do, but because not because it's not good for them, but because he can't live with that. And that's the part we have to be brave about, you know. Because you can't force everyone. We say it. There's a lovely saying in English. What is it? You can bring a horse to water. You can't make it drink. We all know this. This is the wisdom in our mother's houses and our grandma. It's wisdom in the world because we've got to see it's attachment to what I want. And that's what we have to distinguish between that and compassion. So Michael clearly has compassion for his wife and daughter. You can't argue with that. But it's polluted by his attachment to get what he wants and by guilt that he's a naughty boy if he's not there all the time you know and wanted to go away for a weekend because he feels bad or that's um that same as uh who was it where was it that was same as vicky's point exactly the same so she's scared to be authentic and clear because she's terrified he's going to have a mental breakdown and kidnap her daughter his daughter and run away to the other side of the world i mean this is just where we're so irrational and because and because of that she's not being clear to be clear, Vicky, but do it for his sake. And Michael's just got to enjoy your life and let them be. Love them for who they are and do what you can. Of course, it's easy to say this. This attachment is primordially deep. I cannot tell you. And we, I mean, it takes us years to even see it, you know. I mean, some people's attachment is especially the attachment to being a good girl, to being seen as a good girl, you know, to being seen to, to be helping. And then that makes a complete mess, that attachment, you know, because then you make a mess and you over-exaggerate. You stick your nose in where it's not belonging. You don't do what's appropriate and you want to run and want to be seen to be a good person. It's just a, a nightmare, you know. It's so painful. It's so painful. This is why we suffer, you know. I mean, some people have attachment to food and sex and drugs, kind of more gross level. Couldn't care less what people think, mainly for the objects of the senses. That's easy to identify, you know, but although hard to deal with, especially food, because everybody on the planet thinks about food day and night, you know. And then, of course, there's attachment to our own body. That's another whole discussion. And I mean, half the time we say we're attached, we are attached to our body, but we have half the time when we have aversion for our body because when our attachment is never satisfied with what we get. And when it comes to our body, that's a main one. I don't think I know anybody on the planet who is happy with the shape of their body, you know. 
So whether it's in terms of losing weight or changing your gender, or we're always, I mean, you know, there can be a valid thing in losing weight. There can be a valid thing in changing our gender. But when it's coming mainly from attachment, then I'll be happy when I do that. I mean, you know, you have people who get who lose weight and get obese 27 times. So it's a really tricky one to know what is to do it for the right reason and then learn to live with that. It's very difficult, especially when it comes to our bodies, because we we learn we we just never satisfied. We're ne that's the pain of attachment. Another pain of attachment is the never satisfied. Whatever what we do, it's never enough. So Michael's maybe would be that. Whatever he does for his daughter and his wife, it's never enough. He thinks he's not doing enough, so you get guilty. But our bodies, you know, or our possessions or our job or how we behave in our job, we're never satisfied, never satisfied. If I do this, then I'll get happy. If I have this, then I'll get happy. It's the torture of attachment, you know. It's the torture. And it's not easy to fix. The Buddhist perspective is the light, it's the subtlest. It's it's kind of, it's like close to being liberated when you finally get rid of it, when the mind literally is joyful, when the mind is literally satisfied. But we have to practice it. You see, this is a big tricky one as well. This is an interesting point. This is a very interesting point now. In the Buddhist analysis of the mind, they, you know, you can talk about you've got sensory consciousness, which is the physical senses, the eye consciousness, ear consciousness, tactile consciousness. And then you've got, of course, the object of taste consciousness. So the object of taste consciousness obviously is food, let's say. So we all know how gigantic food is for us. So, of course, the impulse is you feel hungry. Your stomach might be empty, but because we're all so attached to food, we can't tell the difference. So then we eat the food and then we keep waiting. We keep eating until we're stuffed. And then we call that satisfied. But you can't, satisfaction, please hear this point. Satisfaction is not a sensory experience. It is a mental experience and it won't come from eating food it won't come from getting thin it won't even come from changing our gender it won't come from a new partner it won't come from anything external it comes from training our mind to be satisfied to be content to feel fulfilled you train your mind it's like cognitive therapy you train yourself to be content doesn't mean you don't do more. People will think, oh, well, I'm content. They become lazy. No. It's a bit like you're, you're, you're learning music and you, and you pass grade one. And first of all, you go, oh, aren't I great? I pass grade one. And before you know it, you go, oh, I'm only in grade one and you're dissatisfied. So then you think, oh, I'll go to grade two. And then you think, oh, I'm only in grade two. And you're never satisfied. So when you become satisfied, it doesn't mean you just sit back and become lazy. No, it means you are happy that you've achieved grade two. You praise yourself for your work. And then you eagerly go to get even more in grade three. But if you're always dissatisfied, you'll get to grade 947 and you'll still be miserable. So don't expect passing the music, the new boyfriend, the wife, the body to make you happy. It's your mental state and you train yourself to become glad and happy and rejoicing and fulfilled. It's training your mind. It's cognitive therapy. I promise you. Are we communicating here? It's a huge one because we just assume, I mean, I know as a kid attached to food, I didn't know I was satisfied until I was full. I just assumed it was that. And it's very, it's so, it's, and that's the food one is the most misleading because we, we assume all oh, that delicious food that'll make me happy, but all it does is make us stuffed. And then we get guilty and then you get acid reflux and you've got to lose weight then. So we're never happy. We just go back and forth like maniacs. So satisfaction is really a state of mind that delights in what you're achieving, delights in your good qualities and delights in your progress. But you've got to say it to yourself. It won't come from just achieving grade one. You've got to say it mentally. It's a mental state that you have to practice accomplishing. I promise. Are we communicating? Good. Huge one. I always remember watching one of those shows, you know, when all these obese people and this little girl was like 500 pounds or something and she even died in the end. But her mother, she was so poignant, her mother said, she's always been like this. She never felt 
full. Well, feeling full means never satisfied. It's not the stomach. It's clear. Satisfaction has to come from our mental state. And that means seeing our good qualities, rejoicing in our progress, being humble with ourselves, delighting in what we're trying to do, seeing our good qualities, praising ourselves. Not arrogance. That's what satisfaction comes from. Not doing the external thing, I promise you. It's a huge one. And it's possible. We can do it. One step at a time. I think that's enough tonight. I think we've had a pretty intense night. All right, everybody. We've all got something to learn. We all recognize what I'm saying. We've all got the same problems. It all just changed various, various shapes and sizes, isn't it? So all of us be brave. Sasha, Michael, you know, Roxy, no, Vicky, who all spoke. That's it. Good on you, people. Never give up. Joey, that's it. Joey, too. Never give up, okay? Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And we delight in our progress. We have delight in our progress. Yeah, okay. That's it, everybody. So happy to see you all, sweethearts. And I'm sorry I was so naughty a couple of weeks ago. I just, what happened? I can't remember. I forgot. Yeah, I, I, what happened? I forgot. I can't remember. I think I forgot. That's right. I just forgot. I have it in my Zoom. It's in my calendar. And that's why it's important. If you do have me again, you've got to give me a call 30 minutes before. Are you coming next week, Rubina? Oh, we've got next week, have we? Oh, good. Let me have it in my calendar. Wait, let me check. Yes. There you are. You're there. So just give me a call. I will. Because then actually, see, if I were coming physically, you'd come and pick me up, wouldn't you? So you've got to do that on Zoom. Pick me up on Zoom. Okay? Rubina, I'm so grateful. On behalf Thank of you, darling. Thank you so much, people. Goodbye, sweetheart. Keep moving. Never give up, okay? And you're all doing a wonderful job, and I rejoice. Thank you, darlings. See you next week.